Um, hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for making it through this day to the last round of talks. Um, yeah, so my name is Andri. I work at the company called Celera One. I would estimate my Python experience around five years so far, but this is the first time I'm giving this talk. So I also hope for some feedback after you, uh, from you afterwards in the end. And yeah, let's start. So first of all, I will give uh, some words about the company, who we are, what we are doing, then introduce the uh, architecture of our platform in a coarse grain level, uh, give some information on how we use Python and Pyramid in general in our software, uh, describe in detail our analytics subsystem, and we finish with some overview on a general development process in our company. So first of all, who we are, company is called Cellular One. Uh, for short, we are calling ourselves C1. The company is relatively young. It was established in 2011. It's based in Berlin. The company is quite small, I would say, for now. We are around 25 people, but it's already quite international because we're coming from nine different countries. And the main product of the company is the uh, platform for doing the paid content, content recommendation, real-time decisions on um, content access for users, and of course, analytics. We are also developing our own programming language. Uh, it's called COPL, as you might correctly guess. That stands for Celera One Programming Language. It's a functional language and strongly typed. The main customers of our company are big media and publishing companies in Europe. So um, try to represent the in infrastructure of uh, our software in a layered level. It's somewhat hard because in reality they are quite often interconnected, but um, this is how it looks. And we go from bottom to top. So first of all, the first and maybe the hard uh, layer of our system, it's in memory what we call engine. And engine is a custom solution implemented in C++. This is a NoSQL in memory database. Uh, it's a bit special. It's not only a robust storage, it also provides some business logic. So engines are usually coming in pair, where one is the master and the second is the replica, and they're connecting to each other uh, using zero MQ. And uh, this is the point actually where all the real-timeness real of our system happens. And um, it stores data in the form of events and streams and indices. And uh, the typical use case would be uh, the real-time user segmentation. Uh, for example, when request comes in, we can define already to which user group user belongs, and this is not a trivial task because it usually, um, each user action brings him actually to the different groups, so basically each action can take uh, him to different groups, and Rangin is quite fast in this case. Uh, he can compute the user group membership just within a couple of milliseconds and provide the result. The next layer would be analytics system. Uh, this is a scheduling application. Uh, written in Django and a set of workers. Um, Django was chosen, of course, for its admin panel. And workers, what they are actually do, they connect to the engines, collect uh, systematically some analytics, metrics, and statistics data, and store it for later usage by the upper level. And the upper level is where we actually use uh, Pyramid, finally. This is the level of RESTful API, and this is somewhat a glue-in layer because it's used for integration of all third-party customer systems into our platform. So basically it exposes API, which are then used by the customer systems like SAP and so on and so forth to uh, interact with our system. Um, it's a Pyramid application served by USGI. It could be served as one big monolithic application or running in several USGI processes. And the topmost layer, layer it's um, what we call communication and proxy. Um, it's implemented in OpenRST framework. Basically, it's a bundle of um, Nginx and Lua code. We also wrote our own extensions in Lua. And because it's super robust, super fast, well, yeah, let's be honest that Python sometimes could be slow. And OpenRST was super fast, so part of API is also implemented in this layer. For example, the endpoints for event collections. And these are the most frequently triggered API where we get like 10,000 requests per second, for example. Um, yeah, it, it's implemented in this part. Also, it's together with the engine is responsible for making these real-time decisions, for example, on content access. 
and uh, it's also responsible for request forwarding to different sub-applications if they are running in uh, separate USGI processes. So uh, before installing our software on customer side, we are usually doing some assessment and somewhat we sometimes face challenges. And the biggest challenge is, for example, at the, our biggest customer, we face that we need to serve at least like 10,000 requests per second. For this, we kind of tweaked our system. And yeah, depending on the customer workload, which is expected and assessed, uh, the setup can come in different ways. The typical, most typical ways is when we have two front ends and two back ends, uh, back ends, I mean engines. Uh, the biggest cluster so far, it's up to five front ends, which are running our Python applications, also serving uh, JavaScript and open REST applications. Uh, and the backend could contain up to nine engine pairs, so totally 18 machines, 64 gigabytes RAM each, and the data would be, uh, some part of the data is sharded all over the cluster, some part of the data is copied for availability reasons. And uh, this makes us store billions events in memory, providing super fast access to this data, and it's given us possibility to serve uh, around 10,000 requests per second. We also use three, oh, sorry, two Mongo replica sets. The first one will be used as a storage for the application data for Python applications, and the second one is the persistence layer used by the engine internally. So the logic is that engine uh, keeps uh, data for sliding window of 30 days, and then starts to back up this data in the persistence layer for uh, availability reasons. So how does the um, Python software stack look like? So first of all, this is uh, USGI as a web server, running in usually emperor mode, uh, then the Pyramid as a web application server. Uh, then we are using some plugins together with Pyramid. Notably, this is a colander and Cornish. Colander is the library used for data serialization, deserialization. Uh, we are using JSON, but it is also suitable for parsing, for example, XML. Uh, some basic validation of the incoming data could be also used, uh, implemented in Colander. And then the Cornish is a plugin from Mozilla. Uh, it actually simplifies our developer's life to implement the RESTful services. It's also quite useful because it's integrated with Sphinx and helps to generate the documentation. Then we wrote a couple of uh, wrappers on top of requests library uh, because we are interacting with the engine over HTTP and we have just some classes which wrap up uh, requests to yeah, interact with our engine. And then Pyramid itself is built on top of the Zope component architecture and we are also reusing these uh, components in our code to implement so-called template points. I will talk about this in a moment. Then the build system is built out. It, as I also mentioned already, we're using Django for the web application of our workers management. And the robot framework is used for testing. So uh, hopefully this is readable. This is an example of some Hello World application which is using the Pyramid, Cornice, and Colander. And um, I'm going to explain step by step what it's uh, on this slide. So first of all, we are defining the data schemas. They describe the uh, parameters that handlers would later expect. And um, would it be the query string parameters or request path parameters or incoming data payload parameters? They could be parsed and treated as a specified type. So the first schema would be used in the get handler it specifies one parameter called username. Uh, it should search for this um, parameter in the um, query string and treat it as a string parameter. And we are saying that this parameter, if it's missing, it could be discarded from payload. So basically that means that after trying to access this uh, parameter in our handler, um, well, it would be missing. We should keep in mind this. and. Um, yeah, going to second schema, which is used then in a post handler. We are uh, describing some basic JSON structure consisting of three fields, where each of those fields should be also treated like a string. We are saying that the, they should be found in the request body. 
And at this point, we can already use some basic validation. For example, we say that the field message should be from five to 20 characters length. And uh, the foo field should be one of the uh, valid values, bar or bus. Providing this, Corn is uh, quite good interacts will, with Colander. Providing this information during this data deserialization, these basic validators will be already checked and the suitable error message is generated and propagated um, to the client, to the requester. So you don't actually need to treat these special cases in your handlers. The Cornish plugin would do this automatically for you. Um, then for some more custom validation, for example, you need some dependencies between the fields in the incoming payload. You can do uh, custom callable validators and pass them uh, later to the uh, Cornish. Um, I'll talk this, about this in a moment. Then uh, we define, finally we define our REST service. It would be called hello service and available at the path hello. Then we decorate our handlers, get and post handler respectfully with the created service and we pass schemas and if we have custom callable validators, we also pass them. So um, at this point we defined handlers for get and post. If a requester account uh, calls for example put, again the cornice handles this by its own and the error message would be generated like 405 method not allowed. So yeah, I would say that this quite simplifies your life and especially if you keep in mind that if you're doing the parameter application for each of the handlers, you need to, during application config, include its path. Uh, you need to add this line for each of the handlers that you uh, plan to write. Uh, instead of doing this, you only need to include cornice during application boot time and just define services like shown. I think it's much simpler. Okay, and uh, this would be an example of robot framework test. So we define the uh, two endpoints for get and post. And now, yeah, robot framework. It's a keyword-based test suite for mostly integration testing because as I mentioned e earlier, our business logic is somewhat split between Python application and the engine itself. Uh, that's why we are mostly doing uh, integration tests. So um, user can combine it so their own keywords to implement more complex keywords and stuff. So our tests would boot up uh, the MongoDBs, the USJ applications, the engines on the background. And this exact test case would then test if our uh, response to the put method is what it is as expected. So just showing you that um, running this test passes. Yeah, at this point, the engines are started locally on my machine. Um, then the test is executed and it has passed. Then it's generating a nicely looking report where, can, where you can see the logs, which what, what happened during your test. If there were any failures, in our case, everything is great. Um, so we are happy to go. Okay, let's continue. Yeah, also uh, we're implementing our application in a way that uh, we dis uh, distribute the uh, um, logic of application into different submodules so that we are making sure that uh, different uh, feature set could be, uh, could be um, put on to the cast outputted to the customer. So we have like, for example, SSO module, the SAP integration module, the analytics subsystem, and on de depending on the customer demands, we are de uh, developing and um, uh, shipping these modules to the customer. So they could be all served as one monolith application or each of them running uh, in the emperor mode and served separately in a separate USJ application. Also one of the challenges is how to keep, because customer base is quite big, we have uh, around eight customers, some of uh, upcoming customers. So we need to keep our code similar, but also we need to uh, provide custom solutions for our customers because the demands could be different, uh, their systems could be different, and the best example maybe is the SAP. It's quite inflexible, it's quite slow sometimes, and for those we need for, to, uh, for example, sometimes develop 
some custom code, and this custom code would be then placed in a separate package, and we are trying to keep our generic code base as generic as possible. And for this, we are implementing so-called template methods in our code, template points, and then the custom hooks which implement this custom logic would be overwriting the uh, generic behavior in uh, the runtime. And thus, we are able to deliver the custom solution to our customers. The example of such case, as I mentioned earl earlier, is a SAP integration, and this is an example of real existing API for importing SAP catalog. So uh, we are reusing the ZOP interface in this case. We are defining the uh, interface called custom catalog transformer. So the whole idea that it has a transfer method which would take the catalog in the format of which customer defines and do some transformation and uh, transform it into the internally acceptable format. And yeah, story. Then uh, we have a generic implementation which actually is doing nothing. Well, it's called default transformer. It lives in a generic custom, uh, code base. It's doing nothing, it just assumes that the incoming payload is already in the internally acceptable format. Then it's during the application boot time, it's registered uh, by calling register utility. And uh, in the meantime, in the cust customer specific code base, in the custom package, we're defining the catalog transformer called sophisticated transformer, which actually does some magical transformation, whatever and brings the catalog payload into internally acceptable format. And then in the customer code, this would override uh, by registering this utility, also during runtime, and then including this custom component into the generic code base, the behavior would be already uh, tailored to the customer. This brings a benefit that the APIs handlers, they all stay the same, so they don't change, and you don't have to split your API between different packages, they all still live in the generic code base, but it still gives you a possibility to uh, implement custom solutions for your customer needs. And yeah, time to speak about our analytics subsystem. So essentially, schematically, it would look like this. We've got engine pairs, the data which we are going to collect, the analytics data, it's sharded between the engines, so we need to query uh, each single of those, then merge this data, and store it for later usage. So workers, they connect to the engines uh, periodically, query the data, do this pre-aggregation and cache it for later usage in the MongoDB. Then uh, the metrics API, we also call it analytics API. This is the pyramid application which would then later read this data and according to the incoming request from our single page JavaScript application, which then should later the analytics data. It would filter this data, additionally using uh, Mongo aggregation framework, produce the result, and based on this data, then uh, nice graphs and charts would be drawn. And yeah, as I talked already, we are using Django. This is a um, scheduling application, so it manages workers. It's possible to see if there are any failing tasks, um, if the tasks should be restarted, how does it look, how does the whole execution process looks like. Um, so at this point I was trying to do some showcase of our analytics. So basically this is our um, demo system and the graph stands for page impressions. And it's uh, possible to see this time span, for example, of one week using the data, different time resolutions. Time resolution usually means how real time the metric is. So this view shows currently a time span of one week uh, with the resolution of five minutes, then we can see the resolution of uh, one hour and even more cost grain resolution of one day. So the time span stays the same, but the total numbers represent different time resolutions. Okay. No, oh, I'm sorry. Good. Um, this is how our Django admin panel looks like. 
here is an overview on the completed task, failed tasks. Uh, you can disable metrics collection for time if there is any um, deployment happening and stuff like this. And on the right side, this is the configuration of the metric job itself. So on the left side, on the left bar, you can see uh, this is would be the time resolution for which we collect the data, and this column means how real time the metrics collection should be. Okay, and for the end, this is the last slide. Um, give an overview on the typical development process in our company. So there is a developer. He makes his changes, commits uh, them to the code review tool that we are using, Garrett. Then the code gets reviewed after some time. The changes are merged to the Git, and Jenkins keeps overview on the Git repositories, and after the code is merged, it starts all the different tests. When your tests are green, we're actually always trying to keep that uh, our master branch is ready for being bomb versioned and released. So if the tests are green and uh, all okay, you can then um, bump the version of your package, then it gets packaged into an egg, put into internally hosted um, Python egg server, then the documentation would be built, and uh, yeah, it would be ready for release. And when the release time comes, uh, we have a wrapper package, so all the versions would be included by the build out, uh, both from internally hosted uh, egg server and also from PyP, that would be combined into the dev or RPM package, developing uh, depending on the customer operating system, and then ops guys are doing their magic, putting our installation on the servers. For availability reasons, we're usually, do, usually doing it in the halfway, so first we upgrade one half of the cluster, and then the second one, so this brings virtually no downtime, and it's not visible to the end users who are using these systems. Okay, so thank you for your attention, thank you for coming to this talk today, and questions. Uh, so I understand you use uh, both uh, Django and Pyramids. Can yeah. you clarify uh, what exactly does Django and what exactly Pyramid? So maybe you can share some experiences of what is better for which use case, what are the strong sides, weak sides? I have some, quite some experience with Django. I think it's really nice framework. Um, but mostly I think that everybody loves it because it has its magical built-in admin panel. And Django is only internally used for us. It's not visible to anyone. It's just for us to uh, oversee how our workers are doing. Uh, if there are any failed tasks that we need to restart, if there are any problems. So it's only like an internal tool. And the Pyramid, it's more flexible. It's uh, used to implement the RESTful API as I described and showed the examples. And this is what actually is visible to our customer systems. So that uh, if they have some legacy SSO systems and they want to connect to us, they would be using our Pyramid API. Thank you for the talk, actually. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask, so <laughs> thank you. Um, no but I have another one. Um, what is your development effort now at the moment? Is it on the analytics part, or is it on the, um, the data scaling uh, deployment on larger scale, if you have, I don't know, any more customers? Would it be easy to do? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question once again? So uh, the development effort you have at the moment, is it on scaling the existing system, or is it on okay. coming with uh, new analytics, new algorithms? Yeah, so I would say that, uh, well, we have two teams. One is C++ team, which develops the engine, and uh, I would say that most of the computation efforts are there in that part. And um, in the Python team, we are mostly working on uh, bringing the different metrics data, so we need to uh, do different aggregations to optimize it, usually. This is actually the layer where we consume probably the most of the memory, so it's quite memory intense, always. We are trying to use different techniques. For now, the Mongo aggregation is doing fine, but the 
workload is distributed somehow between bringing new features which are demanded by the customer and implementing more different kinds of analytics um, and views, I mean, like the charts which would be shown to the customer. Because those are then which are used by the business analysts and based on this data they are doing some decisions which can impact like the income and yeah, stuff like this. More questions? Right, in that case, um, thank you again.